the situation was known to the control room, where a hushed silence fell among those who had witnessed the unfolding scene. The relentless, destructive storm showed no signs of calming down. Fortunately, this occurrence took place in a subspace. The potential involvement of numerous layers of people in a labyrinth setting was deemed unimaginable. Ramirez, expressing her genuine concern, questioned. It's dangerous. The central point of destruction, labeled as the discarded 30 layers, vanished instantly upon contact with the energy of destruction. Contemplating the ramifications of such a malevolent technique being employed on the ground, it was acknowledged that it could lead to the disappearance of the planet and the engulfing of the entire solar system. This level of destructive power surpassed even Velgren's might. The quartet skill, wielded by the world's top-ranked players, achieved unforeseen results through synergistic effects. Amidst the solemnity of the control room, Diablo and Benimaru returned, exchanging cheerful conversation. Well, it was a very enjoyable experience. Yes, it was. My body was screaming. But when the moment came, I felt more energized than ever before. I'd love to do it again. But I doubt I'll have the chance anytime soon. Pufufufu. Kara mentioned something about breaking through the hierarchy, and now I finally understand why she said that. That's true. Testing the limits of one's strength is a seldom experienced journey. Zijin joined the conversation, adding to the lively atmosphere. Ramirez, unable to contain her shaken emotions, contrasted sharply with the composed control room. Her anxiety had transformed into anger as she vehemently declared an absolute prohibition to Benimaru and the others who returned. In the midst of this, Dino, fatigued and unresponsive, Pico and Gracia sat casually on the parlor sofa, seemingly unaffected. Shuna kindly offered tea and sweets to them, saying, Thank you for your hard work. It is inherent in human nature to be captivated by a smiling face and pleasant expressions. Dino, as usual, felt a sense of satisfaction and reward for his hard work, unlike Benimaru and the others who had fought collectively. Having faced the challenges alone, Dino proudly reclined on the couch, treating it as his well-deserved reward. He gracefully relaxed and requested another cup of tea from Shuna, using the act as a means to alleviate his fatigue. The Nimaru expressed dissatisfaction with Dino's nonchalant demeanor. Hey, why are you so laid back? Well, my work is done, isn't it? Then why don't you just go back to your place? Dino looked at Benimaru with a puzzled expression, causing even more bewilderment in Benimaru. What? After the battle is over, we don't need to maintain the consider them enemies during the fight attitude, right? In that case, there's no reason for us to leave. That's not the point. Weren't you guys enemies just a short while ago? Although Dino held the status of a demon lord, Pico and Gracia did not show much respect towards him. Dino, seemingly unperturbed by this lack of reverence, brushed it off and involved Ramirez. What? We've already reconciled, right, Ramirez? Huh? Well, yeah. If you're up for another job, I'm willing to hire you. Ramirez' mood lifted as she remembered reconciling with Dino, sporting a smile. They enjoyed sweets together, but it was too early to tell the outcome. Pico and Gracia were more than relaxed. They indulged in cake, ignoring Dino's conversation in the control room. Eagerly, this is amazing. There are three, so the last one is mine, right? Pico, calm down. This last piece is the one I've been eyeing. What? What nonsense are you spouting? I claimed it first, so it's rightfully mine. A discordant squabble erupted over the cake crafted by Shuna. Dino actively participated or, more accurately, became entangled in the fray. Hey, it's not yours to claim, it's mine. You have no entitlement to it. Dino exclaimed and lunged for the cake, but his insistence fell on deaf ears. Friendship seemed powerless in the face of cake, an observation left to linger among the Tempest members. Benimaru, observing the chaos, sighed. While a fan of cakes himself, he couldn't help but think this was outrageous. I don't endorse indulging a troublemaker, Shuna, but kindly prepare another one for him. Benimaru conceded first, realizing the futility of the discussion. Dino faced unavoidable criticism for lacking the demeanor of a demon lord. Unaware of this, Shuna smiled as Dino and the others continued their stubborn squabble, exposing their true nature. Friendship, fragile as it was, became evident in the trio's cute but unyielding struggle which continued until Shuna stepped in with a new cake. Ultimately, after enjoying the cake, Dino and his friends made the decision to join forces with Benimaru. Consequently, a temporary alliance was established. I may appear this way, but I am a demon lord and I cannot be swayed. Exactly. We need to achieve a minimum of three tasks each day. However, enjoying this cake will be impossible if the world perishes. Cooperation with them is essential. As a result, a mutually beneficial agreement was reached. After negotiations, Dino and his companions were set to be hired by Ramirez, contingent on protecting the world. They chose to align with Benimaru's leadership, 
believing it was the most effective strategy. Like Diablo, Benimaru was confident in their success. Their mission was to defend the cardinal world globally, beyond national boundaries, in anticipation of Rimuru's return. Dino recognized the remarkable leadership of the young man in charge. Observing Benimaru and the rest, Dino contemplated the possibility of Mai returning unharmed. He hadn't anticipated his earnest female colleague demonstrating a willingness for self-sacrifice. While she did assist me, I find myself unable to repay her kindness. Dino reflected, dissatisfied with the current situation. Nevertheless, he resolved to collaborate with Benimaru and the team, realizing that without such cooperation, he would remain inactive. When Mai returns, perhaps we should celebrate with a cake. To make that happen, as Gracia had pointed out, maintaining global peace was imperative. Although Dina wasn't particularly keen on working, he figured, why not? Lost in the unknown space beyond her leap from the labyrinth of Ramiris, Mai Furuki, saved by the automatic adjustment of viable space, craved cake despite the high cost of sweets in the imperial capital. Yuki gifted me sweet potatoes as a souvenir, and it's a confidential fact that it was the most delightful reward for me. Mai, soaked in sentimentality at the memory of Yuki, once found refuge with her when lost in the Empire. Despite gaining the formidable Terra Mater skill, her dream of returning to her original world is nearly impossible due to the immense energy and complex operations required to cross the dimensional barrier. Mai, under Vega's control, feels secure for now, understanding she won't be immediately harmed. Why are you laughing? Nothing. I just had a craving for cake. With your appearance, affording cake shouldn't be a problem. You can't escape from me on your own, can you? Escape? That's impossible. If my body is killed, I'll have the ultimate skill evil dragon king Azita Haka, right? If that happens, you'll be the first one I'll devour. And then, I'll gain your instantaneous movement. Believing he would grow stronger and eventually return home, Vega smiles confidently. Ironically, at this point, Vega's body has already been destroyed, and he's unaware of possessing evil dragon king Azida Haka. It's a humorous situation, highlighting Vega's lack of understanding of his own authority. However, Mai remains unfazed by Vega's threats. It's impossible. Don't play smart with me. If you're talking about sealing my body without killing me, oh, that's not my concern. Mai also entertained this scenario. If Vega's main body were eliminated, the evil dragon spawn confronting Mai would assume the role of the main body. Knowing this, he might attempt to seal it. I considered that, but swiftly dismissed the idea. Is it a gamble on whether you can strip away my power or not? You fool. I'm certain of it. But you can't decipher the location information, can you? What? To move in space, calculating coordinates is essential. You need the current position's coordinates and the location information of the teleport destination at the very least. Hmm. If you kill me, you won't obtain that information. I'm saying that, without my cooperation, you won't be able to use your powers anyway. Mai's aim is to stall Vega's decision if he resorts to force. She succeeds, yet she is aware it's merely a tactic to buy time. Vega is troubled by Mai's assertion and cannot deny it. He hasn't fully mastered the ultimate skill evil dragon king Azida Haka, and as Mai pointed out, stripping her of power would render his treasure useless. It finally dawns on Vega that he possesses evil dragon king Azida Haka, but he finds himself powerless. Damn, dealing with complex powers isn't my thing. But, what's your plan? Mai's teasing doesn't sit well with Vega. Killing her and taking her power would be pointless in their current situation. Uncertain in this unknown subspace, Vega realizes he must rely on Mai for a jump. Waiting for her to recover energy and space-time leap randomly, he finds the cooperation troublesome. Pondering longer might have led him to consume Mai, a solution better than repeatedly catching her. However, Vega loses the chance to decide before finding a definitive answer. What? Oh no, what's happening? Whether Mai or Vega realized it first remained unclear, but a potent and unprecedented space-time storm had suddenly manifested. The laws governing subspace surpass human understanding, leaving uncertainty about their survival amid the space-time storm. We should get away. I don't need to be told. Vega couldn't finish the sentence, and Mai was no different, as a new space-time storm emerged, centered on Vega who radiated increasing power. Kaya, whoa. It was an energy current so overpowering and unmatched that resistance was futile. Vega released his grip on Mai, presenting an opportunity. However, Mai wasn't prepared, and light danced. The vortex of the space-time storm enveloped Mai, causing even her consciousness, a spiritual life form, to become disoriented. You told me not to give up, I'm sorry, Yuuki-kun. Mai released her consciousness. After the sky storm passed, Vega survived, boasting that it was nothing. 
Damn, I lost my. She might be dead now after that powerful energy rush. Vega thought it was unfortunate he couldn't take Mai's power, though he didn't care if she died. He considered himself lucky for surviving, but he was wrong. Releasing Mai proved his luck had run out. In an unknown void, Vega realized his isolation. No sea, sky, or direction. It was utter emptiness. Without reference points, Vega felt movement ambiguity, no magicule, and a stagnant sense of time. Fear gripped him as he comprehended his complete isolation. Hey, hey, wait. Is anyone else here? Damn it. I am the immortal Vega. The strongest and immortal in the whole world. After declaring this, Vega felt emptiness, realizing his immortality. Attempting a grand energy explosion had no effect. Vega was revived, possessing inexhaustible energy, but he resented it. His immortal body meant he couldn't even end his own life. What? No way. Wait, wait, wait. His resentful voice turned into a lament. In that desolate emptiness, Vega bit into his own folly, forever alone and lonely. I'd like to give a big shout out to my top Patreon supporters, Carl Stefan Bernadel, Big Boy J, Cheese Bean, Kevin Matthew, Davon, Carito, Jason Torres, and Edward Bailstream. I also want to acknowledge our top commenter of the week. Thank you all for tuning in. I'll be back with more content soon, so make sure to hit that subscribe button.